Weeks was Whitey Bulger's right-hand man for most of the 25 years that Whitey Bulger ruled South Boston's underground. You know, people, some people are right when they say there's a certain code that you live by if you're a criminal and you don't, uh, you don't give up your friends, you don't rat on your enemies or anything, you just, you know, you take it to the street if you have a problem. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't how it went down. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for checking out American Made. Today, we have a very special guest, a guest that has a very interesting story. For years, he was the right-hand man to the notorious mob boss, James Whitey Bulger. My guest is also an author of the book, Brutal, My Life and Whitey Bulger's Irish Mob. I look forward to speaking with him today. My guest is Kevin Weeks. Kevin, thanks for being here. How are you doing, man? Good, thank you. Good. I definitely want to talk about your time with Whitey Bulger and uh, the Winter Hill Gang. But before we get there, I'd like to just back up and um, talk about your background, you know, where you were born and a little bit about maybe your childhood. Yeah, I was uh, born 1956 uh, in the O'Colony Projects in South Boston. Uh, basically lived here my whole life. Uh, you know, when I was 18 years old, I joined up with Whitey. Now, your family... Yeah. Was there any uh, body in your family that was connected to any type of organized crime? No, no. My uh, my two older brothers both went to Harvard. Uh, my sister was a uh, supervisor at a hospital, emergency room. My other sister worked for the Boston police. And uh, my other sister was a secretary. Why do you think it was that uh, your siblings kind of went in one direction and you kind of went in another? Well, I was the youngest boy, and uh, like I said, my brothers were off from college, and uh, my sister was gone, my older sister, so it was just me and my uh, two sisters at home, my father, my mother, and uh, when I was 18 years old, I graduated from high school. The uh, My mother had uh, severe arthritis. She was on crutches basically her whole life, adult life, and my father had a heart attack. So uh, I had a full scholarship to Harvard. It was more or less a legacy. And when they had the uh, problems, I went and I got a job working. I worked up the high school. And this was uh, the first year of busing. So I worked up there, and uh, that's when I met Billy O'Neill. He was one of the owners of Triple O's. And we were both up the uh, South Boston Court for assault and battery. And uh, he offered me a job working uh, St. Patrick's Day down Triple O's. And I started working down there. And uh, Whitey and Stevie Fleming used to come in on the weekends and stuff. And that was my introduction to them. Now, you mentioned Triple O's. Now, that is that like a neighborhood neighborhood bar type of yeah. thing? Yeah, it was a rough place. And, uh, you know, a lot of fights and everything. And uh, they used to come in, like I said, and uh, we'd talk. You know, because I was at the door, and basically, hey, how you doing? Small talk. And then uh, it eventually got more involved where we talked more often and stuff. And uh, I had fights and stuff where he saw me. And uh, then one day he picked me up and said, take a ride. So I saw I get in the car, and there was a fellow on Broadway he had a problem with. So I get out of the car, and uh, I basically beat him up. And... Uh, the next day, he came by and he gave me an envelope with a thousand dollars, and I can remember this is nineteen seventy four. Right. So about four or five days later, he picked me up again, and there was another fellow we picked up, and supposedly he uh, slapped his niece, and so we drove to down by M Street Park and uh, basically gave him a beat and stuff. Matter of fact, one of the time, why did he hit me with a sap? On my hand broke my hand while I was hitting the guy. Mm. <laughs> he went to hit him. And uh the next day I saw him again. He apologized for you know hitting my hand, breaking it. And he gave me an envelope of five thousand dollars of it. Wow. So nineteen seventy four. Yeah, that's big well, money. Yeah, within the course of a week I made six thousand dollars beating two people up, which I was doing every night anyways. <laughs> and uh 
So, I, you know, I made a joke. I said, you want anyone else beat up? <laughs> he started laughing. And then, uh, I, you know, I was still working the bomb and stuff. But about, uh, oh, 79, Billy O'Neill died. And uh, I went with Jimmy full time. Now, before you met him and, and started doing these types of things, did, was you aware of him in the neighborhood or in the city? Oh, yeah, everyone was. Everyone knew who he was. They, they knew him by name. They didn't know what he looked like. So what what were some of the when, when you decided to go full time, what were some of the things that that you and maybe Whitey Bulger and other guys in, in the Winter Hill gang? What what were some of the things you were doing to to make money on the streets? Oh, um, mostly uh, gambling, you know, the dogs, uh, football, basketball, anything people wanted to bet on. We were getting money and, uh, you know, we had a, an office. They took all the bets and stuff, and then they would give us a percentage of that. And then uh, I was, uh, well, we did a lot of extortions of people, mostly drug dealers. And I was involved in loan shocking and uh, various crimes like that. Yeah, I read somewhere that uh, Whitey Bulger would, and you would, would approach people and tell them that, they, that you had been given a contract for, uh, you know, to kill them. And but you would hold back the contract if they would pay. Is that something y'all would do? Yeah, yeah. You how know. would how would people typically react when you would tell them that? Oh, they'd be scared because <laughs> they knew we were going to kill them, right? And so uh, they would pay. Now, I mean, uh, tell them you can always make money, but you only have one life. Right. Exactly. Uh, another one of your associates and and Bulger's partner was Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy. Uh, what was your first impressions of him? Well, Stevie was uh, Stevie was a nice guy. Uh, you know, he he was uh, he, he was charming, you know, and everything, but deadly, you know. And once he uh, he lost his temper, that was it. He was going to kill anyone for anything. How was the relationship between? Flemmy and and Bulger were they friends like on a personal level or was it business or how was their relationship they were friends on a personal level uh they were business partners um you know ultimately Jimmy had the final say but uh no Stevie Stevie was an equal partner when uh go ahead I'm sorry he was very dangerous yeah I've read that and I've heard that that he was he was a very dangerous person now, when when most people discuss uh, Whitey Bulger or you or the Irish mob, that's something they usually say is you know the Irish mob. Um, but Flemmy was he Ita- He was Italian, is that right? He Italian, yep, he was Italian. Uh, we had a few members that were Italian people, you know, predominantly Irish. But uh, you know, there was a Polish guy. Uh, there was Jewish people. You know, we were all over the city, all, all over the. Uh, New England and uh, all the way down to Florida and out through the West Coast. Did um, did Flemmy? Did he have any connections with the uh, Italian mafia, or did did any of you guys have any connections? Yeah, Stevie was the liaison between the mafia and us. So, uh, I mean, Stevie goes way back uh, to the gang wars and stuff, and uh, his partner was uh, Frankie Salami. Mm-hmm. And Frankie ended up being the uh, godfather of New England, you know, after he came out of prison. Investigators take you inside the mafia now. At one time, they were thick as thieves. But today, notorious mobster Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy sat across the courtroom from former mafia Don Frank Salemi, testifying against him in a high-profile mob murder trial. But, yeah, uh, you know, we had a working relationship. You mentioned the, the, the there were members all over the place, that even down to Florida. The Winter Hill Gang, h- how is that structured compared, you know, like to the Italian Mafia with a boss, and underboss? Was there was there any type of structure like that? Not really. I mean, uh, it was probably like uh, six or seven hardcore members of Winter Hill. Yeah. All of them extremely dangerous. I mean, you know, uh, it they led by example. In other words, uh, 
no one was a guy just calling shots. If something had to be done, they were all out there. You know, they were all shooters. Right. Uh, was there any any business between you guys and, and the mafia? Yes. Yeah. What, what yeah. types of business would y'all do together? Oh, uh, bookmakers and stuff, setting the line on gambling, things like that. Okay. Um. Now, I want to move on a little bit and ask you uh, about the first hit that you were involved in. Was that the Brian Halloran murder? Yes. Yeah, that was a, a double homicide. It was um, Brian Halloran and uh, Michael Donahue. Uh, to back up just a little bit, what, what kind of led up to that, the reason that they was to be hit in the first place? Well, there was a there was a murder out in Oklahoma. Uh, what was the uh, guy's name? It was Wheeler. Roger Wheeler, yeah. Roger Wheeler, yeah. Multi-millionaire. And he had bought World High Life. Well, went to Hill Whitey. They had a piece of High Life. Well, they were getting kickbacks on it. And then Wheeler came into it. He bought it. And uh, he was examining the books and everything. And he was questioning everything. And the, the fellow John Callahan, who was his president of operations... He uh, knew he was going to come down. He was going to discover everything. So he figured if he was out of the way, he could buy and take over uh, World High Lie, and we'd still be getting our money where they would at the time. And uh, so he, you know, everyone says he was an innocent guy. He was an accountant and all this. And uh, he really wasn't. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's orchestrating a murder here. So, uh Two, two guys from Memory went to Hill, uh, Johnny Montevano, who's in the class by himself, and Joe McDonald, the same thing. I mean, prolific killers, uh, went out to Oklahoma and killed him at the golf course. So Brian Halloran says he gets uh, grabbed for murder back in Boston for a Pappas in a Chinese restaurant. They shot him. So he uh, and, and Michael Donahue drove him away from the scene. So he gets caught for that. He tries to make a deal with the feds and he's going to give everybody up for the, uh, will of murder. Now we had no involvement in it, but he had knowledge of it and stuff. So we, we found out basically what he found out and tipped off by the FBI, what Hallam was doing. And that's why Hallam was killed because he was, you know, informing on them for murder. How was the hit carried out? Oh, it was carried out down the waterfront. There's all restaurants and stuff down there. And he was spotted down there. And so uh, Jimmy and myself were up the uh, furniture store that we owned. And uh, Jimmy told me to go down there. You know what? Actually, we drove down Owen Third Street, the old Mullins Club, looking for people. We couldn't find anyone. So he told me to head down there and uh, keep an eye on him. And so I went down there, parked the car. And then shortly afterwards, Jimmy come down with someone in the back seat. They had a ski mask on. And uh, he handed me a walkie-talkie in the binoculars and told me, let me know when he's coming out. So I got in a position. And he got up. And as soon as he got up out of his seat, I could see him through the window. I said, the balloon's rising, because we used to call him balloon head. And then he came outside. I said, the balloon's in the air. And... Michael Donahue picked him up in a little dots, I think it was. And Jimmy pulled right in beside him. And they both let go with automatic weapons. Killed uh, Donahue instantly. And the car drifted across the street. And it's banged into a building. All, uh, up, uh, trying to think there's the post. And Jimmy made a U-turn and pulled up. And Halliman got out and staggered back towards the car. And Jimmy put 21 more shots into him with a 30 caliber carbine. Wow. He was on the ground. He was actually bouncing when the bullets were hitting him from the impact. I bet. And then we all drove away. Mm. And and this was broad daylight? Broad daylight, beautiful sunny day in May. And, you know, there was people all around, probably 1,000 people walking around and everything down there. And you could mm. kill right in front of everybody. How did you feel afterwards, you know, like leaving the scene, knowing you had, this was the first time you had like personally been involved in killing someone? 
No, I was I was fine with it. Matter of fact, I went to supper right after. Uh, you know, but that's when I realized this is real. You know, people do get killed. <laughs> yeah. Up until that point, I wasn't involved in any murders, but when it happened, then you realize this is for real. Did did that bring you? I'm sure it did. Did it bring you closer to Whitey Bulger? I was already close with them. I was. I was. I mean, basically, I was uh, with them every day. You know, so I imagine in some way, you know, in a way that it uh, it attached me to them because yeah. you know, I'm involved in a homicide with them. But I was already close to him. And so from that point, you just, you know, full steam ahead. That's what, yeah, that's how no it was. Back. There's no turning back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned this a few minutes ago, the the Roger Wheeler hit. And I just wanted to quickly ask you a question about, uh, I had looked into that. And uh, a few weeks ago, I did an interview with a guy whose father was an FBI agent, Um that goes back years ago to the top hoodlum squad under J Edgar Hoover. He was actually partners with uh, H Paul Rico down in Florida. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, I know that it's been alleged that H Paul Rico maybe fed information that, that led to the uh, killing of Roger Wheeler. Do you have, um, do you know anything about that or any information well, about that? H Paul Rico was a gangster, <laughs> you know, he was just an FBI agent, but he was a gangster. He, uh, He's the one that set up the hair. Okay. He went out to Oklahoma. He did all the legwork. Uh, you know, did all the reconnaissance, everything. And when uh, Johnny and Joe McDonald showed up up there, he gave him all the information. You know, and what to, you know, he played golf and when he come off and all that. He he basically set the whole he the hit up. Wow. I mean, H. Paul Rico goes all the way back to the gang was in Boston. And back then he was feeding information to Winter Hill, you know, where these people were, and where they were lying their head and the routines and stuff. Oh. A lot of members of uh, the McLaughlin gang got killed. That's that's interesting, because, like I said, this was something we dis I discussed uh, maybe a month ago with somebody who's. Uh, father was partners with him and they felt like that he was wrongfully convicted. Um, no. So that's interesting from your perspective. No, you can, you know, the FBI has got to cover for themselves, which you, today they do it, you know? Oh, definitely. And uh, no, he was, uh, he was almost a full member of Winter Hill, you know? I mean, he was a dangerous guy too. Wow. You know? He had a pine. I probably know the partner you're talking about, you know. <laughs> but uh, matter of fact, uh, they called up Stevie one time and told him where this particular person was going to be in McLaughlin. And uh, he was waiting at a bus stop, and Stevie walked up behind him with a bag with a gun inside it and pulled it out and shot him in the head. And then that night, they called Stevie up and said, Good shooting. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You alluded to this a few minutes ago. Um, years later, it would it would come out about the relationship between the FBI and Bolger. Um, but at the time, I think you you already sort of mentioned this. But was you aware how how much that relationship was that that they was getting information from the the FBI? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, every time we made a score, you know, say we uh, made a score for five hundred thousand. And it was four of us there. We split it four ways. We all got 100000 each. And then there was a fifth share put off to the side that was called the EX. And that was used for our connections in law enforcement and stuff where we pay them money. So, yeah, I was aware of that. I mean, we he, Jimmy had used to claim like six, seven agents up the FBI, which I believe. <laughs> Christmas time, he'd fill up envelopes and, you know, cops and Boston cops, Quincy cops, FBI, mm. state police. I mean, he had it. He had it wrapped up. He was getting information from everywhere. What what type of information were they giving you? Like, to what extent would they oh, give you? People that were informants. Uh, you know, uh, bugging operations. Uh, one place had a bug in a camera, and uh, uh, excuse me, bugging a clock on the wall, and they were waiting. 
was to come in there so they record and pictures and stuff. We never did. I mean, you know, we were told what phones were tapped, you know, what places, different things like that. It was very important. How would he meet with these people? I mean, that's a pretty, pretty touchy thing to to be meeting like that and getting that much information. What what was their plans for meeting and how did they go about that? Oh, well, he'd meet at, you know, their house. He'd meet at, uh, you know, uh, different locations, hotels and stuff. And, uh, you know, he'd talk to him on the phone, you know, go to pay phone and stuff. Uh, sometimes uh, he'd see them, you know, besides the dentist, he'd see them in person, like, you know, and uh, relay information to him. Most of the information was relayed to Jim Conley. Like these other FBI agents would tell John Conley, and John Conley would tell him. Uh, I didn't find out until after I was arrested that, uh, you know, that Jimmy and Stevie would give the information back, mm. which was against everything. I mean, here we are, we're out there killing people for being informants. Then I find out that they're informants. You know. Hey, what's up, guys? I wanted to take a second to remind you, please hit that subscribe button. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that via Cash App at American Made Channel. Now, let's get back to the video. Now, it was the sources in law enforcement that eventually tipped Whitey Bulger off about what, what was it, an, an indictment or something that, that he was tipped off about that sent him right. on the run? Yeah, December 23rd, 94. Uh, John Conley came into the liquor store. I had a liquor store, and he was looking for Whitey and Stevie, and neither one of them were around. So he told me that the uh, indictments were imminent. There was only four people that knew, and uh, you know he's got to go. So I immediately got a hold of Whitey and told him to take off, which he did immediately. I mean, he's always prepared to go on the run. Yeah, that's yeah. not something easy to do, is that? So he was prepared. He had been preparing for this. He had for years. He, you know, he had IDs, he had money, he had everything put away, everything ready to go. So he was gone. And I saw Stevie later in the day. I was calling him, and I couldn't get a hold of him. Finally, he came in, and I told him. And he told me, oh, I got time. My guy's right on top of it. He's in there. And he, he did have a state trooper in a sensitive position. But... Uh, this guy had no knowledge of it because it was really kept low key. There was only four agents that knew when they were top guys in the FBI. And so uh, he didn't leave. And then I saw him a week later. He came to the store and I said to him, what are you doing, Stevie? I says, they're going to arrest everybody. They're trying to put them all together over the holidays. And uh, he's like, no, no, I get time. My guy's on top of it. And I told him, Stevie, they don't know. I says, there's only four people. That don't. We kind of had a little argument over it, you know. Mm -hmm. I told him, I says, take off. I says, if nothing happens, you had a vacation. I said, if something happens, you get a head start. Right. He hung around and he got arrested. Mm. Jimmy stayed out there, what, 16 years? Yeah, I believe it was 16 years. Did you have any plans of going on the run like this? Well, I took off in 95 for uh, about three, four months. Uh, there was someone involved in the case that was talking, and uh, you know he was an associate of mine and stuff. So I thought he might be talking about me, but he didn't. And uh, I came back. You know, I mean, the charges that they were getting arrested for, I had no involvement with, so I wasn't really too concerned about me getting arrested back then. Right. It was later on. Now there were there were like reports of Whitey Bulger all over the world, and as you mentioned a minute ago, you were actually meeting with him during this time. Uh, how would those meetings take place, and where in the country? Oh, New York. I've been him a few times on New York, probably three, four times, I'm not sure. And I met him out in Chicago. You know, how would he get in touch with you? I uh, I would give or I would give him a number from a phone I never used before. And then he would always call me. I couldn't call him because I didn't know exactly where he was. So he would travel around and, you know, he'd call me from different locations. And then I'd give him a new number. So the next time he would call me, I'd be at a certain location at a certain time. And you mentioned um, 16 years. Uh, did you think that they, they would ever catch up to him? No, 
No. Never thought they'd get him. You know, I was hoping they never got him. You know. Why? Why was that? At this point, uh, you had found out that uh, that he had gave information and stuff. Yeah, Did you... I, I, but I knew it was going to be a shit show back here. Right. You know? They're going to be a circus, and I didn't want to be involved in it anymore. Yeah. Now, in November 17th, 1999, you were eventually arrested by the DEA. Yeah. Uh, what led up to that? Uh, they had a couple of people that uh, they arrested. They had them on uh, one guy. He was looking at 90 days. Uh, he was a bookmaker that was paying. And another one was the, uh, just an out-and-out out liar. And uh, so I got arrested on those two pretty good crimes, and then they could go back on everything on me. So they had me on a, a series of uh, 29 counts, Roger Taylor, you know, extortion, drugs, stuff like that. I, even though I didn't sell drugs, I shook down drug dealers, and, but I was still charged with drugs. Right. Now this, uh, well, first off, how, how did you find out, uh, you mentioned it a minute ago, but how did you find out that, that Whitey Bulger and Stephen Flemmy were actually informants and given information on people around you. How did you find that out? I was, uh, it was 97, it was spring of 97. So I, I was home. Uh, I was laying on the couch and uh, I was reading a book and I had the fan blown out and I was smoking a cigar. I was nice and relaxed, it was like 10 at night, and the news come on. And basically, what said in stunning revelation, Steve Flemmy. On the stand, and missed that him and Jim Bulger were informants. I was like, I jumped up. I I didn't know if I heard it right, so I waited until the news recycled. You know, a couple hours later, and there it was. That's how I found out. I'm sure that really like shook you. I mean, this was somebody that oh, yeah. I've read that for years. He he preached never rat on your friends, never give information. Uh, that sort of we thing. have a problem, we take it to the street. You know. Is I mean, it, <laughs> you know, is, like I said, we kill people for being informants. And here I find out that they're two of the biggest informants. Right. Uh, now, this is that the main reason that ultimately led to your cooperation? No, what, what, what happened was uh, when I got arrested, I had uh, a series of lawyers and I fired the first lawyer. And then the second lawyer, who was a friend of mine, you know, I knew him. He was more or less a mob lawyer, come up to visit me. And he had a binder about three inches thick. And he gave it to me in the visiting room. It was just me and him. And he says, I don't know what you're going to do, Kevin. He says, but they're no good. He says, they've been giving up everybody. I said, how's the case look? He goes, you're screwed. You're gone. I'm sober. And I says, all right. So uh, he says, you know, you face a minimum 35 years. He says, and the grand jury going on. He says, 28 murders in your name and a half. And I says, all right. And he says, I would never tell anyone. I would never represent anyone that decided to cooperate. He says, but in your case, he says, I've never seen anything like it. He says, these guys were giving up everybody. And that night I went back to my cell and I started going through the binder. And uh, not only... Stevie was giving up the mafia, really. but there was people in there, but friends of ours. I mean, close personal friends that uh, Jimmy was giving up, you know? And I was like, geez, I mean, no one had a chance, you know? And uh, I mean, some of the things they said in there, these people got arrested for. Right. And about two weeks later, I was, I was in there. And I had a visit, and I come downstairs in the Sally Port, which is down the end of the stairs. And you get the different pods, pods are where they keep prisoners, you know, and different sections of the prison. And a fellow come up to me, and he says, uh, you Kevin Weeks? And I turn around right away. I'm ready to go, you know. And he says to me, he says, he says hey, hey, relax, kid. And I found out he was a made guy from Rhode Island and stuff. And he says to me, listen, he says, those guys are no good. He said, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to take it up the ass for them? He said, they've been ratting on everybody, you know? And so in the meantime, uh, another friend of ours who 
original Winter Hill guy, very dangerous. He made a deal to cooperate against them. And it seemed like everybody that was out in the street were making deals. And I'm saying to myself, what am I going to take out the I'm going to be an asshole here. I'm going to take the blame for everybody. And I said, no. So that's what led me to cooperate against them. And what was you eventually sentenced to? Uh, Six years. And then once you was released, did you ever have any thoughts of of returning to any type of crime or anything? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's all I knew since I was 18. You know, yeah. now I get out, I'm 50. Uh, but and I came right back to South Boston, you know, and uh, I wasn't worried about anybody. You know, I mean, whatever they can do, I can do. I can probably do a little better, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I came right back to South Boston. I had opportunities. People wanted me to put it all back together, you know. People come up to me with scores and stuff, and I told them straight, I don't want to hear it. Good luck with whatever you want, you're going to do, but I don't want to be involved in it. And I went straight after that. You know, I got three beautiful babies now, married, you know, retired. You know, my life is uh, nice. I don't have to worry about anything anymore. That's awesome. Um, I mean, I used to get calls at 4 o'clock in the morning to go out. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. I used to get calls at 4 o'clock in the morning to go out and you know, we we'll go out and do things. You mm-hmm. know? I don't do that anymore. You know? So, so most people in your position that have cooperated, they don't go back to the neighborhood. They don't go back to the city. Um, did you have any issues? No, with no. anybody. No, you know, <laughs> a couple of times I had some, you know, people say stuff, and I go and approach them, find them stuff. And, no, no, Kevin, how's everything? You know, I had no problems. You know, I mean, basically in the town, I know who's capable of what, you know, and uh, they know what I'm capable of. And I still have friends out here, associates that we're involved with and stuff. So I, I don't worry about anything. Well, I, you got to respect that. I mean, going right back to where you where your neighborhood is, I mean, dealing with it head on. That's that's pretty. You know, most people, like I mentioned, they they go somewhere uh, in the, another part of the country and yeah. almost hide out, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no. I had family back here, you know? Yeah. Uh, my kids, and then I got married again. I had three more babies and no, I'm happy. <laughs> now in uh, 2011, uh, and as we mentioned a minute ago, after 16 years on the run, uh, Whitey Bulger was eventually captured. How mm-hmm. did you feel about that when you heard that news? Sick, you know, my phone was ringing off the hook uh, early in the morning, and uh, people telling me, you know, they caught the big guy, you know, this stuff. I was, I was just sick about it because I knew what was coming. Yeah, yeah. as you mentioned, a, a shit show with the media yeah. and the and in court and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, at that time, he was what eighty three years old, you know. Uh, yeah, and eventually you would testify against Bulger in court. And I know at one point I remember seeing in the news, it got pretty, pretty heated at one time. Uh, what was that yeah. interaction like? Well, you know, I mean, the guy was, you know, like my closest friend and everything. And uh, I was on the stand and uh, his lawyer, his lawyer who was a joke. I mean, he pled guilty to half the charges. He pled guilty to everything ex- basically except for uh, murdering a woman and being an informant. And then his lawyer starts on me because I cooperated. You're a rat. So I got heated, you know. And uh, he's, he says, nothing bothers you at all. He says, you have no remorse, nothing bothers me. I says, you don't know what bothers me. He says, nothing bothers you at all. You're reformed, huh? I says, I didn't say that. I said, but I didn't say nothing bothers me. He goes, yeah, well, what bothers you? And he kept on with it. And I finally said, you know what bothers me? I said, we killed people for being informants, and I had the two biggest rats next to me. And uh, Jimmy looks at me, and he goes, you know, he's only 10 feet away from me. He's, he says, uh, you suck. After everything I had done for this guy, and I'm letting, you know, his lawyers... 
I, I look at him and basically he said, fuck you, you know? And uh, he says, no, fuck you. <laughs> so <laughs> my kid's going at it. And I jumped up and my knees hit the table and the table banged. <laughs> and, wow. uh, you know, yeah, I remember hearing this. Yeah. Basically he said, F you. I says, you. I says, you could never beat me when you were young and you still can't beat me. I mean, I was, I was ripping and uh, the judge is banging the gavel and the bailiffs come over. <laughs> now, eventually, uh, Bulger is found guilty of murder and sentenced to two life terms. Uh, in 2018, he was brutally killed in prison. H how did you how did you feel about that? Well, he was in a wheelchair. OK, he's 89 years old. Uh, you know, he was. He was set up. I mean, I know when they take you from one prison put you in another prison, they put you in the shoe, which is secure housing unit. It's the hole, basically, until they decide where they're going to put you on, if you have any conflicts on the compound, or enemies, things like that. Well, he got there like 10, 11 o'clock at night, and he was in general population the next morning. And uh, they knew right where to go to kill him, you know. So, I mean, I, I believe he was set up. Uh you know, and the, and the guy that killed him, uh, I understand because, uh, you know, he was out in Springfield, Mass. He was involved in things with the mafia and stuff. And his boss ratted on him. Mm -hmm. So he was like rats. You right. Know? So, uh, you know, I look at it like, you know, sad that it happened, but at the same time, I accept it. And he was probably better off, you know, 89 years old in a wheelchair in prison. You know? He's, yeah, you're probably right. You know? So that's how I look at it. And I don't blame the people that killed him, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, you so, you, so you think that, that it was a, a setup? I mean, you think you think it was the mafia, or do you think it was oh, uh, no, no, no. the higher than that, or what? I think it was the prison system. Right. Yeah, you know? there was some definitely some, some shady things going on around that, I think. I mean, there was over 100 inmates that knew he was coming, that he was there. In only six hours, and he got night, and he wasn't held at a uh, secure, you know, in, in the hole. They put him right out on the compound. They never do that, you know. Why do you think the prison system uh, would would want to take him out? I mean, they knew what would happen if they had him in population like that. Yeah, I do, I, I don't have any idea why they did it. You know, I mean, I, it had to come from higher than than that. You know, down to the yeah. prison system. Well, I don't know what was going on in there at the time with him, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, again, he made a lot of enemies, uh, you know, at the end with the FBI. They were embarrassed by him. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, that's a good point that, you know, that, that he did embarrass the FBI when all this came out. Yeah. And, I mean, not the guys that were, you know, the agents that were dealing with them and everything, but... Iowa up in Washington. <laughs> he embarrassed the FBI. And we don't forget they had congressional hearings and everything else. Right. Now, uh, eventually, you would write a book titled Brutal, which I encourage everyone watching this video to get. What what led to you deciding to, to write a book about your life? Well, it wasn't willingly. Uh, I was being sued for wrongful death by uh, families of people we had killed. And uh, I think at the time, it was like over $2 billion. <laughs> you know? So I tried to write them a check, but they wouldn't take it. But uh, anyways, <laughs> so they, uh, they decided their lawyers talked to my lawyer, and the only asset I had at that time, because I IRS took everything. Uh, uh, I mean, they even cashed in my life insurance policy, took the cash value. <laughs> they took man. everything. Yeah, so they decided that my story was the only asset I had. And if I wrote this book and the victim's family's got the proceeds, that would absolve me of my debt, you know, and uh, I couldn't be sued or anything, and I couldn't be uh, my wages garnished or whatever when I came out. So that's why uh, the book was written. I didn't want to write it, but basically I had no choice. Did you find that it it was? Did you enjoy the process once you uh, had to do it? You you know you no. was kind of forced to do it. Did you enjoy the process? Some people say know. it's cathartic to to go through the years like that. How was that? <laughs> no, it wasn't for me. 
I didn't enjoy it at all. You know, it was kind of actually a little hard writing the book because. Uh, yeah, I would imagine. It was people out here. I mean, uh, you know, part of the process is the uh, editor and the publisher. They want me to write about women in the book. I wouldn't write about women. You know, they're married. They moved on. They have kids. I mean, they don't want to. You know, they don't right. want to be reading about them. Uh, I mean, crimes we committed and stuff, you know. Uh, I wouldn't talk about certain things. I wouldn't talk about certain people. So, you know, it wasn't. And then, you know, um, I had to think how it impacted my boys at the time, to all the boys. So it was, it was, I didn't enjoy it. Now, what are your thoughts on, I wanted to ask you about some of these movies that have been made and some of them depicting you and your life, uh, Black <laughs> Mass or uh, The Departed. What are your thoughts on some of these movies and how is it to see uh, pretty much you and your story on uh, in a movie? It has nothing to do with me. It's, uh, I mean, okay, let's start with Black Mass. Uh, chronologically, it's out of order. The way things happen didn't happen like that. You know, they got meetings and stuff that didn't happen. Uh, they got, you know, the way Jimmy talked to people. I mean, there's one scene where supposedly Triple O's where Johnny is eating out of a peanut, uh, a dish of peanuts. And Jimmy says to him, like, you know, hey, you get your big greasy fingers in there. People got to, you know. And if you ever talked to Johnny, Johnny would have killed him right there. You know, I mean, Johnny was a dangerous guy. Extremely. So, I mean, that would have been a shot movie at that point, you know. Uh, Jesse Plemons, who played me, it was, that was a joke, you know. I mean, he come out of the beach down in Miami running and he's got boobs, you know. <laughs> it's hmm. like, uh, and, you know, they get us, like that scene down in Miami, stop, Max. That scene down, it's my son, Max. Hey, they buddy, get, how you doing? <laughs> they get that scene down in Miami. It never happened. Yeah. The meeting to kill Halman was up in New York. And it was at a hotel at the airport. Hi. You know? Hey, and, buddy. Uh, Alan wasn't there. And, you know, and uh, uh, Callahan wasn't there, you know? So, I mean, they, they just, they had so many things wrong. You know? did, did you find it at all, even though it was inaccurate, did you find it at all flattering that, no. I mean, that was your you being depicted? Yeah. No, not at all. No, I mean, it's quite the opposite. I, yeah. uh, I mean, just uh, Johnny Depp looked like Jimmy. That's it. Yeah. Other than that, the movie wasn't true at all. You know. Well, what, uh, Kevin? What uh, do you have in the future? Do you have any um, thoughts of writing another book, or what is yeah, your plan? We're, we're just finishing up another book right now. Okay. And, uh, it's called uh, Jewelry Thief. That's the working title right now. So it's almost it's almost completed. You know, uh, the author that I did the first book with, Phyllis Karras, uh, she wanted to write another book. So she asked me and we come up with this. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, my life's been, uh, this is the best part of my life, believe it or not. I mean, I made a lot of money and, uh, you know, had a lot of power and everything else and did a lot of things that most people will never do. And, uh, but believe it or not, this is the best part of my life right now. You know, I'm 67. And, uh, like I said, come here, Max, stand up. No, say, say hi. Hi. <laughs> hey, buddy. This, this is Max. And like I said, <laughs> how old are you? Six years old and I want army guys. Okay, go ahead. He, uh, he was born December 7th, Phil Harvard. You know? oh, okay. But, uh, like I said, uh, that's my enjoyment. You know, him right. and his brother and his sister, and, you know, compared to what I was doing before. You know, it sounds corny, but it's the truth. No, I I, I can understand that. I mean, I, you, you did live a, a crazy life and experience things, like you said, that many people will never. But I do understand what you're saying about, you know, you're, you're being happy now and, that's yeah. with your kids. Uh, I'm a father. My, I have I have a daughter and a three year old boy and a nine month old boy, yeah. and um, so I understand that from a father's perspective. That's that's where the joy is, and that's where yeah, my two oldest boys, uh, forty and thirty seven, and you know, 
the oldest one's married. I get two grandchildren. The youngest one's, you know, he's with a really nice girl and stuff. And they get good jobs. They've never been arrested, been, you know. And, uh, and and I kind of lost out on a lot of years with them. Mm-hmm. You know, as I'd have to run out. I was doing things. It wasn't, you know, I didn't spend the time with them that I spent with these ones. You know, so you can't make up for lost time, but I'm trying. Yeah. Well, that's good, man. And I, I'm glad that, that you're happy and uh, you seem like you, uh, you got a good thing going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. Can't complain. <laughs> Yeah. Well, like I said, man, I, I really appreciate uh, you doing this. Um, as I mentioned, I know I, I you don't I haven't seen you lately on any type of interviews or I know you I haven't seen you on a lot of other channels or anything. So I really do appreciate you taking the time to to do this with me. Yeah. Hopefully we can do this maybe again in the future if you'd like to do yeah. that. Yeah. As long as you like, like, you know, I've got to work around my schedule here. <laughs> no, I know how it is. I'm I'm the same way. I That's. That's yeah. totally understandable. Um, well, I'd be happy to do it for you again. Yeah. Sounds good, man. Uh, everyone watching, thanks for checking out this video. Be sure to uh, check out Kevin's books, uh, Brutal, and then the one he's working on now. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and keep following American Made. I appreciate it.